Thank you, Rafa. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all staying safe. It has become kind of the, the, the usual greeting these days. Um, on this note, we are continuously reading of the negative effect of this crisis, crisis that we are going through and the many challenges that we are facing both on a personal and professional level. But today we would like to focus mostly on the opportunities that are, that are arising that we believe are many. And uh, so one actually of these opportunities has to do with this webinar that has brought together uh, amazing speakers from two continents and we have participants at least registered from all five continents. So I think it's, it's amazing what, how despite being far, we, we have become so close in a way. Uh, so the first thing I would like to do is to thank all of you for being here, uh, for showing up, the ICDR for supporting the event, my co-organizers at ICDR YNI, and of course the panelists that have kindly accepted our invitation. I'm sure you, most of you, uh, know the panelists and they don't need an introduction, but just a brief introduction uh, I will make. And then we have Anna Massa, she's an, a partner at Ellen and Overy based in Frankfurt. Uh, she has some experience serving as arbitrator, but we have asked her today to, uh, just for the purpose of this panel, to mostly focus uh, her answers on the perspective of a party council. Then we have Stephanie Cohen, she's an independent arbitrator based in New York, and of course she will be sharing her experience and thoughts as arbitrator. And finally we have Luis Martinez, he's the vice president at the ICDR and he will provide us some insight on the uh, institutional perspective. We will be addressing three main topics. Uh, the first one will, will be virtual hearings, then remote working, and finally, the new opportunities that, as I said, we believe are many, and I think we should be focusing on this and some positive thoughts. And uh, one last housekeeping matter, uh, I think Rafa already mentioned it, but you have, uh, you will see there's a chat function that you can use to post questions, and uh, I will be addressing these questions to the, to the panelists. So having said this, we move on to our first topic, which is uh, virtual hearings. One of the very hot topics nowadays, we've seen a lot written like how, when, who, several issues that are arising in this respect. And we have decided to address it from two main considerations, first due process and then practical considerations. So turning first to the due process considerations and I will start after this longer introduction with Anna. Uh, the first question will be for you. And uh, it will be whether, would you advise a client to agree on a virtual hearing as opposed to an in-person hearing? And if so, in what circumstances, yes, no? So I think um, the general answer to that question currently has to be yes, because uh, nobody knows when, who, is allowed to travel where. Um, so with the current tra travel restrictions in, in, in place and with uh, arbitration being a measure uh, to settle international disputes mostly, I think the main problem uh, will last for longer than just the measures in place in one country. So I think current, the current advice has to be that you should be prepared to also hold your merits hearings virtually um, even less considerations um, or less concerns for, for case management conferences, obviously, but even merit hearing, I think the main um, gist that I would be saying, I would be telling my clients currently is that you have to expect a virtual hearing um, at least for the next, you name it, year, but that's a guess. Yeah? Um, and if, and to the extent both parties are fine with postponing longer, um, then yes, of course, if the merit hearing is that important to both parties um, and both parties should agree on this, then of course you can put the arbitration on hold. And that's in particular a concern for hearings that have already been scheduled. I think for hearings that or arbitrations that are now beginning, the issue is even more clear because I think for arbitrations that are now beginning, I think in the first procedural orders you will have um, the arbitral tribunal setting out its own power to um, to order the hearing to be virtual. 
Um, and I don't think there's a reasonable objection against that currently. In the current environments, I think the, 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 that's the advantage. One of the advantages of arbitration is that it is so flexible as to allow um, for these hearings to take place virtually. So I think that's the short answer. And that's independent of the circumstances. So, so uh, to, uh, you said that's the short answer. Would there be a longer answer in a case where you would advise against a virtual hearing and say, well, maybe let's wait for the year or however much we need to wait? It's, that's a very tough question. I mean, if you're advising a respondent and the respondent is, is, um, has been dilatory in any event and you're, um, there might be well-reasoned um, decisions not to go ahead and to advise your client, yeah, well, you can use this as an argument to get out of your hearing for a while. Um, and you might have a seat in a country where holding the hearing virtual might actually cause due process concerns. Um, at least in Germany, there's ongoing debate whether and to what extent this is actually possible if only one party agrees. Um, in my personal opinion, that's my, again, my personal opinion is that the better arguments speak for such possibility even if one party disagrees. So I would root for the possibility of the tribunal having the power to order um, the hearing to be held virtually even if the respondent doesn't agree. Um, what then happens and if the respondent doesn't participate or wait, whatever, I, I mean, those are all questions that are probably going to reach the local courts at some stage, whether at the enforcement stage or at setting aside applications, I think that's going to happen. But um, I think it's it's just too, in the current circumstances are so insecure um, going forward that I think there's no, no way around it. Thank you. With this note, I think I would like to turn to Stephanie. Uh, as, as um, so because Anna said something very interesting and I would like to know you with the perspective of, of the arbitrator, when one side wants a virtual hearing but the other side opposes, what would you do and what would you consider? Well, I don't think there is an automatic, uh, you know, sort of default rule. Um, and and I, I'm going to respectfully disagree with, with Anna, um, although I think she, she gave sort of two answers there. First, she said she didn't think that there are any legitimate uh, reasons, more or less, right now under the current circumstances why you wouldn't go forward to a virtual hearing. And then she flagged for us a couple of reasons in particular on why it might be appropriate um, to postpone um, or, or say that you're not going to go forward. One is uh, mandatory rules of, of law. So, um, and I do think there are some other practical uh, reasons and I, I'll, I'll get into them, but I guess, you know, the, the initial answer is that you always have to consider each case um, on their circumstances. I don't think there is an automatic a rule in part because circumstances are, are changing so rapidly. What, what mm -hmm. I think today sitting in the United States versus what, you know, Anna's perspective is um, sitting in Germany may very well change a week from now or two weeks from now um, as, you know, governmental restrictions change, um, as, you know, the data that, that's becoming available changes. So you really do, I think, have to look at the individual circumstances of the case. And I think um, if you have an objection, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is think about what your, what your choices are, um, which are either gonna be postponing, having a virtual hearing, uh, deciding something on documents only, um, or some sort of uh, combination thereof. And when you get to the objection, then it's a question of what is the basis for the objection. And as an arbitrator, I need to think about what my authority is under the applicable arbitration rules, as well as under you know, any mandatory rules of, of law. So the ICDR rules, just to you know, focus on those since we're uh, talking about the ICDR here today, um, I think you look to the general guiding principles under Articles 20 and 23, um, and they give you know, the tribunal broad authority to conduct the arbitration in whatever manner it considers appropriate, um, provided that the parties are treated with equality and that each party has the right to be heard and is given a fair opportunity to present its case. The tribunal also has a duty to conduct the proceedings, and this is mandatory, shall conduct the proceedings with a view to expediting the resolution of the dispute. So I think we get the guiding principles from the ICDR about what a, a tribunal um, has to take into account, but then they also go on to expressly mention technology um, and that that 
in establishing procedures for the case, the tribunal and the, and the parties may consider how technology, including electronic communications, could be used to increase the efficiency and economy of the proceedings. And when you get into the specific rules on hearings, Article uh, 23, that gives express authority to determine how witness are, witnesses are examined and who shall be present during witness examination, as well as authority to direct that witnesses be examined through means that do not require their physical presence. If you happen to be in a case that involves the expedited procedures, there is, which applies by default to cases under $250, um, thousand uh, dollars. Article E9 expressly references the possibility of video conference. So I think under the ICDR rules that there's, uh, you know, tribunal has broad authority and that there are in fact very helpful rules um, referencing technology and video if that is something that that a tribunal thinks is appropriate to go for with a virtual proceeding. So that would sort of be the starting point. Then I think you have to get into what are the reasons um, for the objection. And, you know, as Anna indicated, there's a lot of uncertainty right now about when you could actually postpone a hearing to. So is it appropriate for a tribunal to say, we're going to reevaluate in 60 days or 90 days. And if we determine at that point that we can't reschedule, then we're going to go forward to a virtual hearing. Or would there be, um, you know, are the factors such, you know, considering the overall length of the, the proceeding and the expectations of the parties, how much effort has gone to date to prepare a case for hearing that it seems appropriate to proceed now because it would actually be unduly, you know, prejudicial for there to be further delay. So those are some of the things that I think you have to take into account. One of the other things um, internationally uh, that I think is important is the effect of the time zones. If I have parties in one region, it's a lot easier to schedule a virtual hearing than it is where I would effectively be compelling um, participants to conduct the hearing during the middle of their night, right? If you're in Asia versus the United States, it's somebody is going to be dramatically uh, inconvenienced um, when you're holding a hearing. If it's in Europe in the United States, then you know you could schedule it to start in the morning in the U.S. and in the afternoon in Europe, and you can bridge some of those differences. And so maybe then it's appropriate to handle the hearing differently than you otherwise would, like have shorter hearing days. Um, so I think you have to get into the specific reasons um, on what the basis for the you know objections are, and take it on a case by case basis in order to think about whether it actually makes um, makes sense in the in the context of the case. And I'll. You know, we're going to turn to some of the practical considerations, but just to sort of flag, obviously, the circumstances that you're going to be thinking about are, you know, the nature and length of, of the hearing, including um, issues relating to time zones, complexity of the case, the number of participants involved, um, whether rescheduling would lead to unwarranted or excessive delay, the ability of the parties to uh, prepare for the hearing. Uh, and you're also going to uh, consider technical capabilities and sophistication, um, as well as you know security considerations. Um, applicable data privacy protection laws might come into play, and that might be a mandatory rule of law that I have to take into account when I'm considering either the possibility of virtual hearings or might be more likely a specific platform and whether a specific platform, you know, is suitable. So there's a lot of things that we could talk about and whether there are reasons that would be acceptable in any one case is, is going to depend on how the parties um, pitch it and, and you know, how we can then pivot to mitigate and deal with the concerns that they specifically address. Yeah, if I may, can I add two points that just came to my mind while Steph was talking? I think one other consideration from a council's perspective is as the countries are currently more, more or less in lockdown, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to properly prepare for a real hearing. So I think if every if everybody on the team has to work from home in their own home and they can't jointly meet to prepare for such thing as an oral hearing that potentially takes a couple of weeks, um, I think it's going to be very, very difficult. And it's going to be um, even more difficult if there's two countries involved which have different lockdown regulations. So if one team can prepare in a manner that is vastly different from the other team on the other end of, of the table. I think that's going to raise mm -hmm. fairness concerns, at least it would for me as counsel. Um, that's one thing that came to mind. And the other thing is that 
Um, we might also have arbitrators who actually don't want to go ahead with a hearing. I read a post today on GAR uh, by, an, uh, by, by a Washington-based arbitrator who actually said, I, even if the parties would agree, I, I'm not willing to take that health risk for me personally, um, so I'm not going to do it. Uh, and what's going to happen in those cases? Will, will you need to replace your arbitrators? Will they, is that a reason to step down? Um, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that question, but I think that's also something we should consider in particular in the big cases where we have usually the experienced arbitrators who are usually um, in the risk uh, group that is currently mostly effective, uh, affected. Sorry. And, and that, I think, does tie into, again, what are going to be the circumstances of the case? Because as we sit here today, I think we're mostly, in, in most places, we're talking about everybody participating remotely from their own homes. But, you know, a month from now, there may be places where some people could gather um, and be together in one location. And you're talking about an individual arbitrator or witness or counsel who has an inability to travel or so on. And then you have different kinds of fairness concerns, as I think Anna mentioned, because you're looking at, is everybody on equal footing? And so, you know, how do we look at the equality and fairness, um, you know, considerations there when we're all preparing for a hearing when we're in our own homes, we're, we're all sort of dealing with the same difficulties and circumstances. And that may mean that I need to um, grant extensions so that there's, you know, a bit more time to prepare or, you know, deal with things that way. But again, I think we sort of have to take it on a, on a case by case individual circumstance and that sort of day by day consideration of what's appropriate today and how do we, how do we address it without just sort of throwing it all um, out and saying there's nothing, nothing to be done. Thank you. Uh, so uh from from a furnace perspective the this as you said many elements and let's assume that you evaluate all of them and you decide to move, to go forward with the virtual hearing and you mentioned a few practical considerations already but i would like to know let's assuming that you the arbitrator you in the, in this case decide to move forward what considerations should be taken into account in order to organize a virtual hearing? Well, I should say that at the outset, especially if there's one objection from a party, if I've made the determination that it's appropriate to go forward, I'm gonna to wanna to give a reasoned uh, decision. And you know, depending on the form, I might decide that it's appropriate to do that in the form of an order um, or a form of an award. And so, but that's gonna be something I'm specifically gonna to wanna to think about um, and then address, address in writing. Um, in terms of the, you know, the practical considerations, I think one of the first things is to think about your institution. Um, this is a very much a moving target and we're seeing guidance coming forward from the institution. I know Luis is going to tell us in a few minutes about things that the ICDR is doing, but, you know, as institutions develop guidance and maybe their own default protocols or they're offering particular platforms, you're, you're going to want to, you know, be speaking very closely with the institution and coordinating and, and you know, sort of building off of their, their guidance. Um, beyond that, I think the next question is, you know, what platform are you going to choose? And once you make a, a selection of the platform, what are the available features and how are you going to take account of, of um, the different functions they have? So there are, we often hear discussion these days about, um, chat rooms and uh, breakout breakout rooms. And I think there's some differences uh, that, that people have about whether those are essential features when you're using a video conferencing technology for a hearing or not. Uh, and we can you know, talk about that, you know, some of the reasons why further, but you really have to understand what the functionality of the specific platform is and sort of dive into that. Uh, Privacy, confidentiality, and security are huge. There is, you know, the ICDR rules provide that uh, hearings are going to be private unless the parties agree otherwise. As an arbitrator, I have a, a duty to maintain uh, confidentiality. Uh, so even if there isn't, isn't an express duty on the parties that um, arises under applicable law, that is something that's going to apply to me as an arbitrator. So I'm going to want to make sure that we've adequately discussed and addressed uh, the privacy, confidentiality, and security issues. And 
I think really understanding the nature of the platform is very important because there are a lot of features that may not be listed under the white paper for security, um, but really go to controlling the privacy and security of the process, like the way that things can be recorded and where those recordings are saved, how they're, how they're named and whether they can be located, uh, whether you can lock participants from joining a meeting. Not all of those things are gonna fall under the security. So we have to have a much broader um, conception of that. Um, a couple of resources that, yes. May I just interrupt you uh, with a question? Uh, whose, whose task is it to ensure all, that all these cybersecurity uh, pre uh, provisions are, are met? Is it the arbitrator's task or should there be a secretary or should we create a new figure? So uh, that's a fantastic question. I'm, my preference in the first instance on any of these kinds of issues is for the parties to be um, taking the lead. Uh, and so encouraging the parties to discuss these issues uh, up front to try and agree them between counsel and propose a procedure to the arbitrators. Wow. I think the arbitrators may be giving guidance at this stage since this is new to everybody, um, depending on who the parties are to say, here are some, a list of questions you might wanna consider or a checklist or something for you to walk through. I think that's totally appropriate for uh, a tribunal to do, but. Ideally, you want the parties to be coming forward in the first instance. Uh, and on security in particular, um, I do, again, also think that's for the, the parties to make a de determinations about what's appropriate. And I would um, you know, invite everybody to consider the, both the ICDR best practice guidelines that are being circulated in all of their cases now, as well as the more detailed guidance that I think is compatible with the ICDR uh, guidelines provided by the ICA uh, New York City Bar CPR protocol for cybersecurity and international arbitration. Um, and if you have any questions on that, you should ask Steph because she was a member of the task force for that there, report. It's one of my favorite topics. I can't <laughs> lie. We, we got actually a question from from uh, from one of uh, the uh, from one of the attendees. Sagari Gupta is asking. Uh, whether you think that the ICA cybersecurity protocol will, increase, will increasingly be adopted by parties and institutions given the focus on information security? I have seen it referenced um, so much more frequently in the last week or two. It's amazing, um, the, I think, the effect that it has. It, it's guidance. And I think one of the ways in which it helps is it provides a risk-based framework to allow parties and tribunals to think about how does this apply to my individual case? Because there's, there's no one, you know, one rule, one, one size fits all on, on security. And if you're discussing trade secrets, you might need other security measures than if you're not, for example. Exactly. And it provides, I think, you know, it also provides sort of the basic things that you want to consider. So for example, I would say things like passwords, limiting hearings to authorized attendees. Those are some of the very, very basic things that should be done in every case because there's no reason not to because it does provide a baseline for the privacy and security. Um, but then, you know, there are more sophisticated things you can do. Anna just mentioned, you know, if you have a case, for example, using trade secrets, I might decide that I'm okay having my hearing over um, a platform such as Zoom with appropriate protections in place, but I might decide that I don't want to screen share the documents that might be recorded there, that I want to use a separate and more secure document sharing um, platform yeah. for the exchange of documents and, and reference for witnesses so that I have greater control over the, you know, some of those uh, features. So I, I do think it's a great resource and I, and I think people will um, be looking at it more. And if one good thing comes out of this, I think a greater culture of security and in international arbitration is one of them because we're all, we're all thinking about it more. Um, we're forced to. And I think, I think you also mentioned whether and to what extent we're going to see a new person emerging in arbitration. I think it might not be a new person, but I think there will be more offers um, by arbitral institutions, by hearing centers, and whoever is um, on the market with a viable product first, I think is gonna be um, hit by a number of requests to hold hearings via a secure 
um, with all features that you need, um, which can guarantee GDPR compliance, um, which has the, 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 the respective protocols in place, which can kind of provide all that support to tribunals and cases um, that are now going to be held virtually. I think that's going to be an offer that is um, inescapable and to I emerge. I think so, and we see some of that already being available. I mean, I know Arbitration Place in Toronto, for example, yeah. is saying it's offering that through um, multiple multiple platforms. And um, your choices are really: does the tribunal kind of operate the the controls? Are you the host of the virtual hearing? Is there an institutional role where someone from the institution is providing um, technical support or, you know, sort of managing the, the hosting? Is it a combination of the tribunal and the institution? Is there a virtual tribunal secretary where you appoint a neutral person to, you know, manage all of the technical stuff? And then I think the last thing is, are you going to have a technical person um, available for each party, available for the stenographer? Support available for the interpreter. I mean, depending on how sophisticated the parties are and how you know complex the case is, parties might agree that you were going to have people in all of those roles. That that could become you know much more uh, cumbersome and, and require a lot more coordination in advance than just turning on Zoom with the arbitrator and you know one one counsel for each side and a couple of witnesses. So these are all going to be very, very different hearings that unfold, but it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. We, we have one more question from, uh, from a participant, Brian Jones. Uh, he's asking, in determining whether to move forward with a virtual hearing, how much consideration should be given to the inability to complete discovery practices that normally require the physical presence of case participants? And how would an arbitrator weigh the inability to obtain such evidence? So he refers mostly to depositions or site visits. I'll defer that to Steph. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, I think in any one of those instances, it's going you know, some of these things are a bit of a moving, a moving target because, um, you know, I don't know about everybody else's jurisdiction, but there's a lot of, you know, courts are suddenly holding some proceedings virtually that they haven't in the past. So in terms of discovery uh, in the United States, for example, there's, um, there's law about whether you could compel um, attendance in front of an arbitrator and, and uh, get pre-hearing testimony from someone you know, through a subpoena, uh, more or less. And that, I think, mostly contemplates being in person and presence in front of the tribunal. Um, the way that it's been construed to date, but have we ever been in a circumstance like this before? Um, and is that how courts would interpret it today? I, I don't know that. So I think on any of those questions, um, you know, again, there's not going to be a knee jerk response. I'm going to want to get hear from the parties and ask them specifically to consider have the courts looked at this before? What are courts doing right now on their own terms in terms of things like you know, depositions, if that's something that was required. I mean, in arbitration, we have a lot of flexibility over the procedure. And so is there a, yeah. you know, we're not going to have depositions in most of our international arbitration cases, right? They're presumed that they're not going to happen in an ICDR case. So we're really talking about dealing with non-party, um, non-party documents or non-party, you know, obtaining materials from non-parties and specific statutory rules. And that that we're just going to have to look at um, and, and hear from the parties on it. Thank you. No, uh, thanks. Now, going back to the considerations, uh, and uh, we've heard from the arbitrator's perspective, and now I would like to hear from Anna's perspective. Uh, what are the main aspects that you, as a party council, would consider when organizing a virtual hearing? I think those are the same as Steph just mentioned. And essentially, it's mm -hmm. privacy, it's confidentiality, it's cybersecurity, um, because of course you have to safeguard your client's um, information that is handled in within the ambit of the of the of the hearing. And if that hearing is uh, is held virtually, you need to consider things as 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 Steph just all mentioned. Uh, I, um, and I agree with her that I think the lead should be with parties, um, and if possible, the parties should agree on on 
the specific procedure that they want to follow. Um, it is helpful if you have a tribunal that actually has some kind of idea of, of um, what a virtual hearing is. Um, if you have arbitrators who are not, then I think uh, you're better off with an institutional arbitration than with an ad hoc one currently, because then you would kind of have to agree with a party that are already in dispute um, on issues of procedure, which the tribunal might not be fully on top of. And then if you don't have an arbitration uh, institution in the back, I think you risk the, the derailing of the, of the hearing in total. So I think, um, um, and if and to the extent you can agree now with a counterparty that have ad hoc clauses in their, in their, um, in their contracts, I think you're well advised to consider, reconsider to changing that to institutional arbitration at least. Um, yeah, but that was a kind of a, uh, yeah. Would, would you also consider farther, because uh, I'm sure now most uh, council do consider enforcement uh, possibilities? Would you, is it something that you would further research or deeper research than you do now? Yes. Yeah, so I have a short it? answer. <laughs> yes. I think, I, think no, I, I think, I think, sorry, go ahead, Steph. You go ahead, Anna. You finish. <laughs> No, I think I think um, all of this has enforcement potential and enforcement enforcement issues because you have depending on where you want to enforce this award, mm -hmm. um, there might be mandatory rules of law that actually form part of the transnational or whatever you want to name it public policy that has to be taken into account under the New York Convention. Um, so I think there might be issues going forward um, with this. But again, I think we're all. The, the world is in the same situation now. And I think the courts are gonna look at these awards that are gonna be handed down following the virtual hearing with the same um, approach and background and knowledge that we all have because we all share the same um, fate currently. But then, you know, I mean, I think that really comes comes back to um, the importance of, you know, papering what you're doing, which number one is if there's an agreement to proceed, there's not going to be an enforcement issue if you, you know, present that in writing or that, you know, the tribunal records that the parties agreed and that's, you know, why you're going forward uh, with that mechanism. The issue is going to be if one party disagrees and there again, that's why I think reasons are important and, you know, doing that research up front. Um, is important. I mean, I think there are there are a couple of other sort of practical things that you're going to want to to work out. Um, and all of these are things that, you know, again, if, if the parties are taking the lead and they're discussing up front, you're putting together a specific procedural order, you know, at the end of the day that governs virtual hearings um, and covers off the things that are unique to a virtual hearing, um, much in the way when you prepare for a hearing otherwise and you're dealing with all the procedures on how the hearing is going to unfold, but you do have to take extra care. And one of the bigger things on the virtual hearings is you have to test it. And so that's one of the things you're going to be building into your, you know, procedural protocol is opportunities to test it and how it's going to be tested. And the tribunal has to retain the ability to say if there's an objection at that point from a party that the, the platform that's been chosen isn't adequate to allow the parties to present their cases. You have to be able to pivot um, and, you know, and, and step back. And so, um, you know, the specific things that I think you have to think about are the witness evidence. Um, how you're going to deal with um, with concerns about credibility uh, by you know placement of cameras and staging so you can make sure there's nobody else in the room, um, the possibility of um, surreptitious recording. So how are you going to deal with that? Are you going to cover it off in an oath that the witnesses give? Provide instructions for your camera to be turned around, you know, in a 360 degree view periodically. So taking into account some of those kinds of things about uh, witnesses, for the tribunal, I think you're going to want to um, think about how you're going to um, mean, be able to maintain a view of the tribunal um, and of the witness so people have an understanding of the different display options and so on so that the tribunal maintains control of, of the hearing and you still have the gravitas that you expect in an in-person hearing. Uh, and then how communications are going to happen between teams and between the tribunal privately um, during the hearing. So, you know, these are all things that you have to walk through uh, mechanically and figure out in advance of a virtual hearing. And it's not the same depending on what platform you use. And it's not the same depending on 
um, you know, yeah. the specific security considerations and data protection considerations in, in uh, individual cases. Yeah, maybe to add on to that, I think uh, some of us were, were, were arbitrators at the Vismut uh, that was uh, in Vienna hosted by the e-mediation platform. I think that was specifically designed for mediation, but it has been used for the Vismut. And I think that worked really well, I must say. Uh, so at least it worked. But I didn't get, or may, maybe I was not tech savvy enough, but I didn't get to kind of fix the tribunal members and kind of have, have a view of the tribunal at the same time while, talk, while counsel was talking. But I think that is something um, that would be desirable. So in particular, also for counsel, because they kind of want to see how the tribunal reacts to certain questions. Um, and if you can't see that, then I think that the cross-examination is much more difficult because you can't react to views of the tribunal. Uh, so. Thank you, Luis. We haven't forgotten about you. <laughs> so I'm sure the ICDR as an institution uh, is also like considering all this uh, practical and due process aspects. And uh, could you please maybe share with us what kind of tools has the ICDR implemented to assist both arbitrators and parties when they decide to go for virtual hearings? Sure, it's my pleasure. I did want to start, though, Yale, by thanking you. Uh, Yale Ripko, for those who do not know, is a member of the ICDR YNI's Global Advisory Board, and I appreciate you taking the lead and putting this program together, along with my colleague, uh, Rafael Carmona. Also, for those who join late, don't forget to visit the ICDR YNI membership site. You can see programs there. The, this recording will be posted there, as well as other materials, including information on how to join. So I thought I'd give you the AAA ICDR perspective on the virtual hearing scenario. Um, and starting off with a little bit of context. First of all, you have to remember that the ICDR has really incorporated virtual hearings for some time now as it relates to telephonic conference calls. We've been using them for years on the administrative conference call, the first call with the parties and the case council to discuss the actual clause and the process at hand. And that's always followed by another conference call, the preparatory slash preliminary hearing call, the first call with the arbitrators, the case counsel, and the parties. And that's where we're going to discuss the framework for the arbitration, the process, the schedule, and logistics. Uh, so these telephonic hearings have been used consistently for some time now. And also keep in mind, and Stephanie did mention that, in our revision to our international arbitration rules, in 2014, which are currently in effect, we did look at process efficiencies and uh, what we could do to, that would result in a savings of time and money. And to that end, we incorporated mechanisms such as the expedited rules, document-only arbitrations, specific accelerated time frames, and we primarily tasked the arbitrators with the requirement that they should conduct these proceedings with a view to expeditiously resolve these matters. So couple that with the other provisions, the use of technology, there is no prohibition uh, to have virtual hearings uh, and the hearing on the merits virtually conducted as well. Um, so for us, I think now the biggest challenge concerns the fact that we just cannot hold in-person hearings at all for the time being. We have our facilities closed throughout the United States and in Singapore. So what we're doing is offering the Zoom option for the uh, hearings. We've done extensive work in gearing up to use these uh, Zoom mechanisms for these virtual hearings. A couple of examples, our legal department is just finalizing our protocol. Uh, for video conferencing, it's gonna include sample orders the arbitrators can use as a template to start off to prepare for the video conference. It will have a uh, suggested procedures for how to proceed uh, and it'll have a virtual hearing guide as well. Internally, for the last three weeks to a month, we've actually set up a team comprised of executives that's been looking at all of the Zoom options, the Zoom settings, um, what what to turn on and turn off as you prepare for these particular Zoom conferences. We highlighted some of the things that we knew were necessary, the need to conduct test calls, obviously mentioned the camera positioning, Wi-Fi capabilities, 
the need to avoid using virtual backdrops like I'm using now, and uh, noting that the panel can at any time ask the witnesses, for example, to pan around the room that they're in, uh, obviously to avoid the possibility of coaching, how to use breakout rooms and waiting rooms, etc. So from our perspective, once the parties and arbitrators have agreed to use the video conferences, um, we'll set the Zoom hearing up and work with the arbitrators during the test process and discuss the options that they want to use for their particular hearings. Now, we have initially focused on the Zoom platform as from what we're hearing, that appears to be the one most in demand. But the parties are free to use any platform they prefer. And it's going to be up to the parties to decide on the suitability of any of these platforms, including their security for data and the information exchanged during the video conference. Now, uh, we had discussed, that Stephanie mentioned that uh, we did promulgate our best practices for maintaining cybersecurity and privacy. We have a cybersecurity checklist. All of these can be found on the uh, abr.org slash technology services site. And we're gonna be following those cybersecurity measures and it's really part of our ongoing training with our arbitrators but we cannot speak to the security measure offered by these uh, third-party platforms. Now, I would say that the trend to date appears to be, so far anyway, that the parties are agreeing to postpone the in-person hearings. We are not seeing the parties opt into this option in any great numbers so far. They're postponing the hearings uh, and hoping to an end to this crisis as, as we all are. So, that's really the perspectives we have with uh, using Zoom right now and Zoom platforms. Okay. Uh, may I ask you, there, there have been some security concerns in connection with the Zoom platform. Has ICDR taken any particular measure to address these concerns or, or how is this dealt with? It has you been know, we're going to leave we're going to leave it to the parties to do their own investigation. They have to be comfortable with the security measures that these platforms offer and do their due diligence. You know, from our perspective, we're willing to adapt it and we have licenses and we'll set it up. We've looked at all the possibilities and how these things should be conducted and the best practices. They'll be reflected on our protocol, but it'll be up to the parties really to have a full understanding and be comfortable with the suitability of those platforms. You know, I think on the Zoom um, in particular, it, it highlights the need to focus on both, you know, the individual platform, but also what the specific concerns are that, that are being raised. Zoom went from using something like 10 million people using it a day to 200 you know, million. It's absolutely gone through the roof. And it's not surprising that there is going to be increased scrutiny of any product in that case. And it's not you know, all, all platforms that are out there have, um, you know, the ability for security vulnerabilities to be identified in them. So a lot of what has been written up by Zoom about Zoom has focused on things like Zoom, so-called Zoom bombing, which is when someone shared a link and they haven't taken the very basic, basic steps to, you know, limit it um, with a password or, or, you know, they've made the URL publicly available. It's not limited to authorized attendees. They're not trying to lock participants when they're in there. So you need to think about, you know, those kinds of considerations. You need to think about what the reaction of Zoom has been as a company. They've made a number of statements about, um, you know, how they're pivoting to address concerns that have been raised. And, you know, that is something to, to watch because, you know, if they don't follow through, certainly you're not, you know, are you going to want to use them? I don't think so. For now, does it give you possibly give it com give you comfort to using them? There's good reason, you know, to give you comfort on that. And then, you know, on the encryption issue that has been raised, that again is, you know, how are they pivoting to address that? What level of encryption do I need for my um, case? And do I have an understanding of the specific concern that was raised because it, some of that stuff does get very technical. Um, and if you're using a license on your own as an individual user versus using the ICDR's license, you're going through some of the ICDR system. So you have additional security 
protocols that are in place by virtue of using Zoom through the ICDR that you don't have if I use either a consumer version or even if I as an individual use the pro version. It's not the same as the enterprise version. So I, you really have to take, you know, instead of sort of saying there are concerns and I can't use this, maybe it's suitable, maybe it's not um, for your particular case. And, and, you know, maybe another one will take over, but you have to balance all of these things. And that's really the approach that I think is advocated by the, the um, ICA cybersecurity protocol is to, to take it and think, you know, balance what, what am I getting from the platform? Why am I choosing this versus another one? Is there an alternative that's better that has the security that I want or addresses those concerns, um, but also has the functionality that I'm looking for? Um, you know, you have, to, you have to do all of that individually. Thank you. The, the, a lot of research. Yeah, yeah, we will get experts in all these things. We will have to. Uh, the, there's a question uh, from Cheryl Agris for Louise. It's whether the ICDR will be sending update emails uh, when various materials guidelines become available and whether they will, uh, you will be providing training to arbitrators and parties with respect to the, uh, how to conduct virtual hearings. Hey, that's a great question. Thanks for that. And yes, we will. We will be announcing updates. Um, there's a good deal of information on our main page on how we're working during the uh, COVID crisis. Um, I think one of the main components in messaging there is reminding people of the various platforms that they can manage their cases virtually online using our AAA ICDR web file. Uh, we, you know, for years now, our business continuity plan, having been impacted by 9-11 and Hurricane Sandy, we looked at ways of being able to operate remotely, and uh, a number of our executives already had that capability. Now we've extended it to most of our employees, so we are operating remotely, we are providing administrative services, and we're fully operational. The thing is, is that parties can file their cases online through web file, the information will be available. What we do administratively, notice of hearings, documents uploaded, financials, they can track through the AAA web file platform and see their cases progress. And that links to the third platform, the ones we have for the arbitrators, who can sign on and if they're appointed to a particular case, will have access to all the documents and the processes. So. The electronic platforms are all in place and uh, we are seeing an uptake more on the usage of those particular mechanisms. Uh, I, I think in general that um, if we look down the road in the future of this, one of the benefits, if you have to say some of that, will be greater efficiencies definitely in the process, more of the remote administration, more of the video conferencing, the technology continues to improve. So um, those are the benefits, I think, in the overall, because we will be seeing a savings of time and money and quicker resolution to these disputes. Thank you. I, I would, Steph or Anna, have anything to add? Because I think otherwise, I, and I know I, I, I said when we, when we started that we would deal with three topics but I would skip the second because we are almost out of time and I really want to discuss the new opportunities and Luis has already mentioned some. And I would like uh, to hear as well from Anna and Steph, what new opportunities do you think lie ahead? Steph, you wanna go first or should I? I, I, would, I saw you unmute your microphone, so I was waiting for you, your turn. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think as always, I mean, in times of, of great uncertainty, there's always um, great opportunity uh, for everybody involved. I think going forward, um, arbitration is going to evolve a lot faster than it would otherwise have, um, because we're all just forced to use the new media means we have available. Um, and I think we're, we're all just getting used to um, talking on WebEx, talking on Zoom, using different features, checking cybersecurity protocols. Um, so I think we're gonna change a lot faster than we would otherwise have changed. And I think not all of those changes are for the worst. Uh, I think it's gonna be um, 
uh, in particular for case management conferences, I think video conferencing is going to be the new normal. It's not going to be the exception. It's going to be the rule. Um, In-person meetings are going to be less frequent, which makes it less costly. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just reading the chat. Could you also ask the speakers about employment opportunities for fresh graduates and in international arbitration? Uh, uh, sure. <laughs> we, are, we always look for, for talent at A&O, and I bet Sherman does as well. And I don't know whether Steph has, has employment opportunities. I'm, uh, I'm afraid not. <laughs> vir, vir, virtual assistant, potentially. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. experts. I think in the in the in the short and medium term, I think we're going to see younger arbitrators um, because I think one consideration you currently have to take into account is whether and to what extent people are actually able to handle these hearings mm -hmm. virtually, um, and the health risk that just goes with choosing old arbitrators currently is just. I, I think it's a, it's a it's a it's a viable risk to take into account when you advise your clients on who to choose as your arbitrator. Um, so I think that's another opportunity for us younger, um, younger, youngish um, arbitration practitioners uh, to kind of step up and, and, and take the lead in, in those disputes going forward. And there's going to be a lot of disputes. I mean, I, that's another thing <laughs> in certain times, there's going to be a lot of disputes because nobody knows um, how and why and where this is going to end up and who's going to in the end bear the risk. And that might lead to a lot of parties hopefully settling their disputes. Um, because uh, that's just the best way forward for probably both counterparty. If you take a transaction for both parties involved, I think the best way forward is to settle these disputes. But there are going to be disputes that can't be settled and that will likely go to arbitration. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot of them coming up. And I think, um, again, not all changes are for the for the worst. I mean, I, most of you probably know Lucy um, Greenwood's uh, pledge um, on greener arbitrations. I think we're going to see a lot less paper. I mean, I'm I'm working paperless since uh, probably 10 years, but I think um, people are now going to realize that it's so much easier if you have uh, um, searchable PDFs uh, instead of paper filings. Um, and I think people are just going to realize it's it's better for our environment. It's better for the case handling. It, it makes it swifter. It makes it easier. So I think we're we're transforming faster than we would otherwise have. I agree with a lot of um, a lot of what Anna said as well as um, Luis. I'm not sure that that we're going to see um, significantly less in-person hearings um, when we're sort of back back to business. I think there's a there is a preference for them, and I I think um, you know that's and rightly so. I'm I'm not saying that uh, personal in-person hearings are they're obviously for merits hearing if possible the better option. Yeah? Um, in most cases, but uh, again, I mean, nobody knows when, and to what extent they're going to be possible to be held. Right. Out. And I think, you know, the question is though, you know, if, if everything were back, you know, back to normal tomorrow, um, would we have more people considering virtual hearings as an option when they didn't before? And I think, you know, and I would hope that certainly in some of the smaller cases, um, in particular, um, that that ends up being something that is considered, you know, more often to recognize that, you know, there are a lot of reasons why we've been scared to do some of these things in, in the past. We've been unwilling to do it, but actually we can deal with a lot of the due process considerations. It, it, it is more efficient and cost effective. And so there's, you know, sort of a, a different kind of delivery of justice, if you will, in a lot of instances that we're not taking advantage of tools that we've had for a long time. A long time, so you know. Again, that's going to be on a case by case basis. But I do, I do think that there's hope that um, in appropriate cases that it will become uh, more common, and that parties will, you know, have greater confidence in its suitability um, and and recognize that that's flexibility that arbitration provides uh, to be able to make that decision on a case by case basis. So that. You know, we talk about arbitration being flexible and being able to tailor it to the specific needs of a particular case, but, you know, very often we, we go with what we're most comfortable with and what we've always done. And anything that sort of forces us to rethink why are we doing things the way we're doing and what makes sense for this particular case, I think that's a lot of what we're 
confronting right now. And we're forced to think about that in ways that, that we haven't been forced to. And so to the extent that that causes people to think more deeply, that I think is going to be a good thing uh, and allow us to sort of help arbitration live up to the promise of, of really meeting the individual needs of particular cases. I, I would agree. I would agree with you. Um, quite frankly, I, I do expect that people will now really start to realize some of the alternatives and efficiencies that they could consider and draft into their arbitration agreement, uh, having been forced to do it through this process, but it will open some eyes. I certainly think we'll see more of the documents only arbitrations expedited rules arbitrations and exploring these efficiencies. In terms of particular sectors, so many sectors have been affected by the COVID crisis that it's hard not to think that there'll be spikes in particular sectors. Certainly employment disputes, construction, healthcare, oil and gas, finance, and insurance coverage. Just think of the disruptions we've seen in those uh, particular industries with frustration of purpose, loss of revenue, non-performance. Um, they're probably a good number going to lead to disputes down the road. So uh, there'll probably be a surge, but um, uh, hopefully still we get through this as quickly as possible, as I've been saying. And, and with a greater culture of security. <laughs> yeah. And Steph, maybe yeah. one, one thing to add, I think you just said, well, if tomorrow everything goes back to normal, uh, whether there would be less in-person hearings, I would agree that that's probably not the case. But since this is not changing tomorrow, but rather probably somewhere down the road, end of the year, I think all of us will have gotten used to various platforms. I think we're going to be getting more and more accustomed with using the tools that we have available. And I think therefore that if it kind of, if towards the end of the year, we go back to normal, if that's possible, um, then I do think there's going to be less hearings because people are just getting more and more used and acquainted to these new techniques. Yeah, I, I was just reading before before joining the, the this uh, panel a uh, uh, text unrelated to arbitration, but saying like if we uh, go back to normal, then we haven't learned anything. We need to go out of this better. So I think it's the best opportunity to to just like take what's good and improve it, and leave behind what's bad. Uh, so so just kind of to come up better out of this and. It'd be I a new normal, yeah. Yeah, a new normal, a better normal, hopefully. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add. We received quite some questions, and if you don't mind, just uh, maybe 10 more minutes to answer a couple of questions. Sure, sure. <laughs> Great. So one one of the questions we it's it's actually been repeated, uh, and people seem to be quite interested in uh, advocacy style. Whether you think it will change as a result of virtual hearings, or how will it be impacted? I think that's a good question. Um, I think the the uh, difficult difficult question. I um I, I think it's going to be. Opening statements are going to be much shorter, I think, because it's just uh, unbelievable like, to listen to somebody talk for two hours on a video link. I think that's just not going to be as, um, I, I just don't, that's a gut feeling. Um, so I think that that's going to be, they're going to be shortened. Um, and I think what's even more important is, is uh, a clarity of thought and a clarity in language. Um, portraying what you want to convey to the tribunal, I think that's going to be more difficult um, in a virtual setting than it already is in real life. Yeah, yeah I agree with I agree with Anna. I mean, I think um, shorter cross examinations as well, um, right, yeah. are likely to be the are likely to be a major effect. Staring at a screen, we have a different attention span than when you're in in person, and even if you're taking yeah. breaks, the breaks are different. Like if you know, as a tribunal, if we're not going into a, a break room together to have a cup of coffee versus, you know, you're going off in your own individual home, that the dynamics are all very different. And I think we have to recognize that, that that's different. And we are going to see, you know, changes in some of the advocacy style. I think the other thing that's apparent about virtual hearings is, um, you know, while the norm, I think, in international arbitration is to have written witness statements uh, in advance, that's, that's not everybody's preference. And 
uh, it greatly facilitates, I think, a virtual hearing if you have written witness statements uh, in advance and you've prepared your case in writing because it enables you know, the parties in the tribunal to consider you know, what you want to focus the presentation of the case on um, when you recognize that there's a shorter attention span. So you know, it forces people to, to really, I think, pay attention to what the most important points are in their cases, uh, and it may sharpen advocacy in that respect. And it might actually also lead to the lead to the fact that potentially some issues, only some issues will be subject of the merits hearing and others will be decided on documents only. And yeah. I think parties would be agreeable to that if everybody agrees we only need a witness for X uh, and we don't need whatever else uh, we had a, as, a, as a witness testimony or we, there might even be agreement on certain factual issues because people just, um, try to limit um, what they really need to what try sorry people limit the the hearing to what is actually really necessary I would also add that I'm interested to see how it develops I can anecdotally I can tell you that our teams especially those involved in all the testing mechanisms their proficiency with the platforms has improved dramatically and uh, that's very helpful I think for advocates they're really going to have to coordinate and test how they're going to present their case, how they're going to share documents, how they're going to use yeah. perhaps the whiteboards. Uh, they'll be challenged to try to concisely uh, move through the various types of presenting their cases and the limitations or the capabilities of whatever platform they use. So I think there'll be a premium pace placed on those firms that can really jump up and use these platforms effectively. I would agree. So unless you have anything to add, I will uh, read another question, which I found very interesting. Would any breach of confidentiality arising from, from cybersecurity issues potentially give rise to liability of the arbitral institution and or the arbitrators who agree to take on the role of host in a virtual arbitration? From the <laughs> perspective, I'll just say that we will have a disclaimer. Again, what I had mentioned before is that the parties are going to have to decide if they're comfortable with the security measures and the suitability of any platform they use. We're not in a position to guarantee that or, or to know its vulnerabilities. Uh, they'll have to decide that. We will apply our cybersecurity guidelines and uh, to the extent possible, work with the arbitrators to ensure that that's been implemented and, and they know the processes of passwords and proper technology and protecting of the data and the data transfers. But when it comes to these platforms, they're third party platforms and uh, they'll have to decide if they're acceptable or not. Um, and and to add to that, um, I, I think the, the short answer is it's highly, highly unlikely. Uh, and the, the longer answer is one, because um, there is no guarantee, absolute guarantee of security. And that picks up on what Luis has just said. You're looking in every instance to take reasonable measures. Uh, and if a tribunal is making a determination that it's appropriate to use a particular you know, a platform or what have you, they're not guaranteeing the security um, the security of the platform. They're not guaranteeing everything's going to be uh, perfect in terms of, you know, laws in different jurisdictions about liability of arbitrators. Um, you know, if you're in the United States, uh, which has, you know, the, the, the greatest protection for arbitrators, if you're doing something um, in connection with the arbitration, um, you're, you're going to be subject to uh, immunity, the doctrine of immunity. If you're in other jurisdictions, uh, you're either looking at a violation of the fundamental sort of contractual duties, uh, and I don't think that's going to be the case if there's a, you know, uh, something in, in case of a, a security, um, you know, glitch or, a, you know, a malicious actor, as long as you've taken uh, reasonable steps to try and comply with the order and, and you know, using basic uh, security measures. If you're out and out negligent and you say you've done things that you haven't, like you're sitting in a Starbucks conducting the hearing over, you know, Starbucks Wi-Fi, I mean, that's a game changer, right? All of those things are going to change and, and whether you're negligent um, is a totally different story. But for the most part, arbitrators, parties, if people are 
you know, using common sense, if there were something that was unfortunate that happened or you make a mistake, I don't think liability is going to flow from that in, in any jurisdiction. I really don't. Yeah. Thank you. I have another very different question. Uh, so New York Convention, the New York Convention refers to the law of the seat of arbitration and the law of the country where the award was made. How are these territorial links likely to affect arbitrations that might be conducted remotely from multiple locations? I, I don't think that's um, an issue. Um, you know, under the ICDR rules, and you have a comparable provision in basically all of the major international arbitral rules, but I think it's Article uh, 17, is it, Luis? Maybe you correct me if I'm wrong, but um, which provides that, um, you know, a tribunal can determine where uh, to meet physically and it'll still be deemed to have taken place at the place of arbitration. So if I determine that I'm going to hold a virtual hearing, it's going to be deemed to have taken place at the place of arbitration. So if anything, I think we see more flexibility for, you know, the sort of relocation and, and the hearing taking place from those multiple virtual um, places rather than, you know, just moving from a physical, from a physical location. So it's just sort of a, a spin on a rule, a principle that's already existed. I agree. So do I. Uh, so uh, one last question, maybe. Do you think that virtual hearing will be included in future arbitration clauses, or will it be left to the procedural order after the arbitration has commenced? I think it's wise to not include it in the arbitration agreement. Whatever you include in the agreement limits choices later. So I think um, depending on, on um, I, I wouldn't even see an ex exception to that. I, I would leave that to the, to the tribunal's discretion and then to the procedural order instead of already now putting it into the party agreement. I, by and large, rarely see great specificity in the arbitral agreement. Normally, they adopt the uh, short form Standard. clause, which you can yeah. find in the rules, or they can go through. We have this app called clausebuilder.org, and you can see a bunch of options there. It's a point and click app that takes you through all the steps and issues you should consider for both an international and domestic clause. But I would agree that you know the rules do not prohibit the video conferencing. It is a tool, it's still available. It's always been available like telephonic conferences and you can uh, agree to do that with the other side later on or request it from the tribunal. Uh, in situations such as we're seeing now, it is really the only alternative that we can do. Um, and you do not want to prejudice or delay the uh, eventual hearing, so you're using it, but I, I don't think I would put it in as a rather specific point in the arbitration agreement. Keep the option. Thank you. Steph, do you have anything to add? No, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think that goes uh, along where you want to keep your options, all of these things. You don't want to commit to using something in your clause. I don't think you want to commit necessarily to a particular platform, you know, nine months in advance. You know, you might want to evaluate that closer in time. I think on, on flexibility is, is key here and, and you're always trying to preserve that. Great, thank you. So with this, I think, would you, Anna, any of the three panelists have anything to add? Just uh, thank everyone for their time and for your moderating, and it was a pleasure to be on the panel with my colleagues. Yes, I, thank you, and I, I know I, um, some of this might get superseded by what the ICDR shares in the next uh, week or so, but um, I did draft a, a, um, a Zoom order um, with some of the considerations that you might walk through um, for conducting a virtual hearing that was published um, on TDM just today. In fact, so if you have access to OJMID or TDM, you can find it there. Otherwise, I'm happy um, to share it, but I suspect that a lot of it is going to align with um, some of the materials that the ICDR, you know, shares uh, later this week with respect to that, or I'm not sure if Luis promised the next week, but whenever, whenever that's forthcoming <laughs> from the ICDR. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Yeah, and I can I can only add that that draft order is very helpful, Stephanie. I think that's a, it's a great start to kind of start thinking of these things through and 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 um, take it from there on a case by case basis. And I would I also of course, obviously want to thank Yaya for having me. It's uh, it's been a pleasure to see you and Steph and Luis 
and Rafa in the very beginning. Um, <laughs> I think this is just one, one, I have a motto since October last year, essentially saying step by step, because anything else just doesn't work when everything's too much. So I think this is another step into the new normal for me. So I'm um, happy to have been a part of this um, webinar. Thank you. So thank you all very much for sharing your ideas about a better normal, hopefully in the future. And I would like to thank for sure Steph, Louise, Anna for being here and sharing your thoughts and ideas. Uh, thanking of course the participants, uh, Rafa for the organization behind the scenes and my co-organizers at the ICDR YNI that have helped as well in the organization. As Rafa said, I'm just repeating for those that join later, the recording of this session will be available. And I am also aware that the ICDR YNI is organizing other webinars. So uh, if you register, you, uh, it's, uh, the form is in the website you will receive all the updates on new events. You can also follow it on uh, social media, I think LinkedIn, Rafa, correct me if I'm wrong. And with that, I only have to thank you all once again, and hopefully see you when we are out of our lockdowns. Thank okay, you. take care everybody, thank you. Take care. Thank you. Take care and bye -bye. stay safe. Bye-bye.